In ancient Greek mythology, Atlantis or the islands of Atlas, the Titan, were the naval enemies of Greece, besieging ancient Athens, the great naval power of antiquity. In the fictional story, Athens repels the Atlantean attack, giving testament to the superiority of Greek philosopher Plato's concept of a state. The story ends with Atlantis falling out of favor with the gods and submerging into the Atlantic Ocean. The mythological naval power would have been destroyed. Atlantis never existed, it's a mythological creation. But the reason why I bring it up is that some people determined to prove the impossible that Atlantis did exist, claim that one of the possible locations for it is the Portuguese archipelago of the Azores. Some people believe the nine Azorean islands could be the mountaintops of Atlantis, the only remains of the submerged island of antiquity. Now, I'm not saying this is true, of course, I don't believe it at all, but it is a fun fact that the location which some claim to be the remains of antiquity's biggest mythological naval power belongs to the country which holds the record for the world's oldest continuous naval force and which had sea traveling as a big part of its existence throughout time. This is the story of one of the mightiest navies in history and the oldest one still in existence, the history of the Portuguese Navy. The Portuguese Navy was created in the year 1317 in the 12th century by King Dinish. It is the oldest continuously serving Navy in the world, but the practical existence of the Navy dates even further back and 1317 is only the official legal foundation date. By 1180 already, Portuguese ships were taking part in battles against the Moors during the times of the Iberian Reconquista. King Dinesh enacted a specific policy that helped launch and maintain Portuguese ships throughout time. The expansion of a pine forest in the region of Leiria in Portugal. The wood from these trees was used for ship construction and the sap used to coat and protect the wood at sea. The Lusitanian ships also played a key role in the early stages of the kingdom, helping yet maintain its independence from Castile. A Portuguese naval campaign in Galicia led to the conquest of coastal towns, as well as the destruction of several ships that were on the way to reinforce the Castilian forces that were besieging Lisbon at a time. In July of 1384, the Portuguese navy was able to break this siege and supply the city, defeating the Castilian navy. So since very early on, it had a key role. In this video, I want to show you the various moments in which the Portuguese navy was determinant or at least important to the countries and even sometimes the world's history. By the end of the 14th century, a new importance was granted to the navy through the desire of maritime expansion and the beginning of European colonialism. As those who are, according to their own national anthem, heroes of the sea, set sail towards unknown oceans and lands, Portugal became the first naval world power. In the beginning of the 15th century, Portugal was in a period of peace and stability, contrasting with the rest of Europe, which was involved in wars and feudal conflicts. This allowed Portugal to be the only capable country to methodically and successfully start the exploration of the Atlantic at this time. Through their navy, they expanded into North Africa, establishing some fortresses. Next, they surveyed the African coast by sea, reaching the Canary Islands. They were also also able to map the waters and weather of the Atlantic Ocean, developing sailing and navigation techniques and methods which were complete technological innovations, paving the way for European exploration of the world and consolidating their maritime superiority. A few of these inventions were the sea astrolabe, used to determine the latitude of a ship at sea by measuring the sun's noon altitude or the altitude of a certain star in order to know where they were going, or the nonius, created in 15 42 as a system for taking finer measurements on circular instruments such as the astrolabe itself. They were also experts in creating ships able to endure the types of trips required to explore the world. The caravel was the main ship that they used in the 15th and 16th century and by using a triangular sail they were able to more effectively travel 
through the oceans. There were also square rigged caravels, a larger size version of the original with more maneuverability and combat capabilities. These are usually seen as the precursors of the galleons, the very large ships used first by the Spanish in their maritime travels and colonial empire. A fun fact, going back to that mention of ancient Greece, is that the name caravel is likely to have come from there. The Portuguese introduced the name caravela, but this is said to come from the Arabic carib, used to refer to an ancient boat type known as carabus in Latin or Greek. The Portuguese also used another type of ships, which they called nau. In English, these are usually known as carracks. Essentially, they were an improved form of a simple ship, first used for trade in the Mediterranean, but then improved by the Portuguese to endure the waters of Asia and America. In this picture, we can see a naval battle with carracks and galleys. The galleys are the ones with the several oars. While more mobile, the firepower of the galleys probably didn't even come close to that of the carracks. These innovations and modernizations protagonized by the Portuguese Navy were likely key in giving them the edge for maritime exploration. They allowed them to travel through more dangerous waters and further away from the coast, crossing capes never reached before and reaching seas and lands unknown to Europe. In 1488, the Portuguese consolidated their role as the main explorers of the African coast by crossing from the Atlantic to the Indian Ocean in what is now South Africa. The turn, known as Cape of Torments, was renamed Cape of Good Hope. This sort of marks the beginning of the apex of Portuguese dominance of the seas, the beginning of the colonial period. At this time, Henry the Navigator, a Portuguese prince, founded a school of navigation in Sagres, which was a place to discuss the art of sailing. And the first results of this effort came soon, with the discovery of Porto Santo Island in 1419, Madeira in 1420, and part of the Azores in 1427. And the maritime accomplishments kept piling up, one after the other. In 1498, sailor Vasco da Gama discovered the sea route to India, and it was at this time when exploration of the Indian Ocean began, that the new ships, the Nauch or Carracks began being used. In 1500, Pedro Alves Cabral discovers Brazil. The same year, another captain, Diogo Dias, is the first European to reach Madagascar in Africa. And the navy wasn't only important to discover new lands, but also to assert control over them and over the seas that surrounded them. The local sultans and kings didn't want to give away their power and opposed the Portuguese. In 1509, Portuguese ships achieved an enormous victory over the Muslims in the Battle of Diu. In the Far East, Portuguese navigators continued their progress, visiting China in 1517, Australia in 1522, plus reaching Taiwan and Japan, where they became the first Europeans to arrive. They enter the Red Sea in 1542 and successively destroy the mighty Ottoman Armada. In the West, the Portuguese visited the coast of New England in 1520 and California in 1542. But they didn't only use their naval might for their own gain, also helping some of their European allies to aid the Christian forces in the conquest of Tunis in 1535. King John III sent the Portuguese galleon Botafogo, the world's most powerful warship at the time, armed with 300 and 66 cannons. Now, I won't get too much into the explanation of the Portuguese colonial empire. That's for another video, and if you would like to see that, let me know in the comments below. Here, I just want to give you a general look at the way that the Portuguese Navy existed throughout history since very early on, and their importance to Portugal and the world as the oldest continuous naval force in existence. The time of Portuguese dominance of the oceans lasted from around the 15th to the 16th century. After after that, other European powers started becoming more internally stable as well and following the example of the Portuguese, using their navigating and technological innovations, plus coming up with their own as well. The first to follow were the Spanish, followed by the British, 
French, and Dutch. The Spanish and British armadas were also tremendous fleets in history, eventually much more powerful than the Portuguese, especially in the case of the English. They also occupy places in the top 10 oldest continuous naval forces in the world. Spain is number two and England is number six. So eventually the might of the Portuguese fleet became diminished. In 1580, there was a succession crisis and this resulted in many years of Spanish rule of Portugal until independence was restored in 1640. During these years, the Spanish took control of the Portuguese fleet and merged it with the Spanish Armada. With this significant reinforcement, the Spanish king decided to attempt to invade England, and the Portuguese sailors, longtime allies of England, were forced to fight against the British. Portugal provided the most powerful squadron of ships of the invading armada, including its flagship, the galleon, the Saint Martin. Portuguese participation also included a squadron of nine galleons, two zabras, other types of ships, and another squadron of four galleys, with a total of 16 vessels and more than 5,800 men. The attempted invasion ended in the naval battle of Gravelines, where the English won, defeating the Spanish and destroying a big part of their fleet and consequently the Portuguese ships as well. In 1640, independence was regained and the Portuguese returned to some of their previous naval accomplishments. In 1660, they made the first supposed crossing of the Northeast Passage, sailing from Japan to Portugal through the Arctic Ocean. From this moment onwards, the importance of the Portuguese Navy became somewhat smaller. It still played a key role, especially in some specific historic events that we'll take a look at in a second, but the overall dimension of its achievements was smaller. Here are a few of the worthy moments in the 18th century. At the request of the Republic of Venice and the Pope in 1716, the Portuguese Navy sent a fleet to stop Ottoman advance in the Mediterranean. This expedition would culminate in the Battle of Matapan in 1717, in which the Portuguese fleet, supported by Venetian and Maltese ships, defeated the Ottoman navy once again. In 1770, they stopped naming ships after saints, now choosing mythical, historical, or royal names. The Royal Academy of Midshipmen was created in 1792 as a university level naval academy, and this academy is the origin of the current naval schools of both Portugal and Brazil. And they also participated in wars that weren't even their own, helping the British against the Spanish and French, then the Spanish against the French, and then the British again. Essentially, it seems that whenever someone was at a need for some naval support, the Portuguese Navy was the one to call. And next, came the time of Napoleon, who caused one of the greatest moments of the Portuguese Navy. Portugal was one of the few European nations that didn't immediately succumb to France and sided with the English. Because of this, they were invaded with insufficient forces to fight off the invasion and in order not to be captured and keep the independence of the kingdom, Prince John of Portugal activated an ancient strategic plan to transfer the headquarters of the Portuguese crown to Brazil. And it was the Navy who executed this mission. And so, in 1807, the royal family, the government, and 15,000 state military officials and their families left Lisbon and sailed to Brazil, carried by a Portuguese fleet in a gigantic trip that took several months. In retaliation for the French invasion of Portugal, the Portuguese forces in Brazil conquered French Guiana in January of 1809 through a sea invasion. Eventually, a few years later, Brazil became independent and its first national fleet consisted of a number of Portuguese ships. During the Portuguese Civil War from 1828 to 1834, most of the fleet remained loyal to the absolutists, while the liberal forces, eventually victorious, had to build a new fleet to invade Portugal and take power. And this event is important because it symbolized somewhat of a crisis. The liberals won the civil war and a constitutional monarchy was implemented. But the fact that the navy mostly sided with the absolutists was not forgotten. And so a feeling of mistrust emerged between the royal house and the navy. The long period of conflict that goes from the Napoleonic Wars to the end of the civil war also weakened the country, creating a lot of instability. This plus the damaged relationship I just mentioned caused a sharp decadence of the Portuguese Navy. And essentially 
actually that marks the end of the glorious times of the world's oldest navy. During the 19th and 20th century, new modernizations took place such as the introduction of steamships in 1830. The Portuguese regime was unstable, its empire was diminished and overshadowed by other European powers who had surpassed their naval capability and technology. They still had an important role at an internal level in the transport and maintenance of the remaining colonies, but that was about it. In World War I, the Navy was involved in Portugal's entry in the war because in 1916, the Portuguese Navy captured 38 German ships anchored in Lisbon. This is followed by the German declaration of war on Portugal. And during the war, the Navy was important to fight off German forces in Africa. One of the key ships captured by the Portuguese was one called Rickmer Rickmers. This ship was then used as transport by the UK and ceded to Portugal after the war, becoming a school ship for the Portuguese Navy, now named Sagres, which coincides with that first Navy school that we saw the Prince created early. Today, the ship has been updated, although curiously, it's also a ship of German build, apprehended by the US in 1944, then being sold to Brazil first and then to Portugal in 1961. And it is the most well-known and famous ship of the Portuguese Navy. In the Second World War, Portugal remained neutral and the Navy contributed to the defense of the Portuguese neutrality. Just like during Napoleon's time, the Navy had to plan an evacuation to Brazil. During this time, they also had to plan an evacuation to the Azores. This was planned to happen in case of an enemy invasion and successful occupation of continental Portugal. The risk of the invasion was considered high and plans for it were actually made by the Germans in operations Felix and Isabella, but this never ended up happening. After World War II, Portugal was one of the founding nations of NATO. In the Cold War, the Portuguese fleet actively participated in the defense of the North Atlantic against the Soviet naval threat, standing out by the development of a high proficiency in the mine and anti-submarine warfare. During the Portuguese colonial war, the Navy also had the role of transporting soldiers to the theaters of war, as well as supplies. These days, the Portuguese Navy is still involved in the defense of the Portuguese coast and sea territories. They also take part in NATO initiatives and also in efforts of humanitarian aid as well as anti-piracy initiatives in Somalia, for instance. So that is an overlook at the history of the oldest continuous naval force in the world, the Portuguese Navy, from the moment of its creation in 1337 until today, allowing us to see at which moments their actions were determinant to Portugal's and sometimes even the world's history, the key events in which they participated and why they were so important and how they managed to be at one point, one of the world's most fantastic and powerful naval forces. Some of that might may be gone as it's normal that it is. Times have changed, there's no more lands to discover and thankfully much less wars to fight. But time after time, the Portuguese Navy have remained present, century after century, always being present and always having determinant roles in most of what has happened. And who knows, as humanity expands outside of our planet, perhaps it'll be the fate of Portugal to once again lead the world in its exploration of the unknown, through bravery and technological development, paving the way for the colonization of the universe, traveling not through water, but through space. Thanks so much for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, subscribe to catch future ones. If you notice any mistakes or have any additional information, leave a comment below and I will see you next time for more general knowledge.